Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Karen Donfried, the president of the German Marshall Fund of the United States, and I want to wish all of you a very warm welcome to what I know is going to be a wonderful event as we remember Helmut Schmidt. When Helmut Schmidt passed away late last year, there were many tributes to this remarkable statesman. And one of the tributes that really caught my eye was written by one of our panelists, Ted Zummer. And he talked about Schmidt's life as saying it was a life lived for Germany. And I thought that was such an interesting way to capture him. And we have a stellar panel to reflect on what Schmidt's legacy means for us today. And I want to say how particularly honored we at GMF are to have Dr. Henry Kissinger here anchoring this panel. This packed house, and hello to all of you out there. We're also live streaming the event, so we have lots of folks in other parts of the US and Europe watching. The packed house is a testament to the quality of this panel. And along with all of you in the room, I want to highlight that we have many stars from the GMF constellation here today. And I want to give a special welcome to Dr. Guido Goldman, who was the Chairman Emeritus of GMF, to Robin West, who is our current chair, other current board members who are here. We also have past board members, as well as a past GMF president. So it's great to have that support. I also want to say we have a nice showing from the diplomatic corps. I'm particularly delighted that Germany's ambassador, Peter Wittig, is with us. And when we were conceiving this event, we thought it would be great to have it be something that organizations devoted to the German-American relationship could do together. And I want to give special thanks to those who cooperated with us on this event. And that is the Zeitstiftung, the American Friends of Bucerius, the Center for Transatlantic Relations, Georgetown University's BMW Center, the American Council on Germany, and the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies. It's really great to have you all here. Now, for those of you in the audience and on the screen who are media mavens, we of course encourage you to tweet. So the hashtag is pound GMF Schmidt. Very easy, GMF Schmidt, so tweet away. Now to our incredible panel. As I noted, it is anchored by the remarkable Dr. Henry Kissinger. And thanks so much for joining us to discuss the life and legacy of Helmut Schmidt, who as you know, <laughs> And as we all know, Helmut Schmidt had a remarkable career. The highlight was his time as West German Chancellor. He served in that role from 1974 to 1982. And it certainly that is a legacy that lives on today and well beyond. In many ways, Schmidt was a chancellor unlike any others in German history. And I think that will become clear through the conversation we have here. He was known for being candid and truthful, which both impressed people and offended them, perhaps in like measure. But it was part of how he was as effective as he was. And when we conceived the event, we thought, well, who could we have? for this. And here at GMF, and then in discussion with our partners, we all thought Dr. Henry Kissinger would be the ideal person. And to show that we were substantiated in this choice, when I Google Helmut Schmidt, if you come up on Wikipedia's entry, you know, they always then have that people also search for. So it turns out that if you search Helmut Schmidt, there are five people that you also search for. His wife, his daughter, Willy Brandt, Helmut Kohl, and Henry Kissinger. So clearly, this was a smart choice on the part of GMF. Now, I have been fortunate to be at other events with Dr. Kissinger. And the person always says, you know, Dr. Kissinger needs no introduction. And then I've heard you say more than once, but I really like it. <laughs> so I thought, well, okay, I should give you a little bit more of an introduction. Uh, he is, of course, well known to all of us. He is a former US Secretary of State, former National Security Advisor. He has made contributions far beyond government as well. He is a very esteemed, uh, 
professor and academic. He continues to write incisive analysis on commentary on every aspect of foreign and security policy. And the fact that applause broke out earlier is a tribute to his government service, to his service in academia, to his ongoing diplomatic engagement around the world. So he clearly is one of our great statesmen, and therefore it's only appropriate that he be part of our reflection on Helmut Schmidt and his legacy. And I just want to underscore how honored we are to have you here today. Now, one of the many things that is striking about Helmut Schmidt is that he was blessed with a long life. So his contributions outside of government were equally impressive. And one of the choices he made after leaving the chancellorship was deciding to go and work first as a co-publisher and then as acting director of Die Zeit, Germany's leading weekly newspaper. Schmidt in that role continued to be one of Germany's most preeminent elder statesmen throughout multiple crises in those following decades, up until the current rupture with Russia. And we're very lucky to have our panel be joined by two former colleagues of Helmut Schmidt's at Die Zeit. We're very lucky that Theo Zammer is with us. I quoted him earlier and would commend to you this moving tribute that Ted wrote. And in that, he spoke about Schmidt's passion, his commitment to the Constitution, and Schmidt's true heart. Ted was editor at large of Die Zeit from 2000 to 2014, and arguably had the best seat in the house to observe and challenge Helmut Schmidt on his impressions of politics and society around the world. So Ted, we're so grateful to you for making the trip across the Atlantic to be here. And then I want to also highlight Constanze Stelzenmüller, who currently is the Robert Bosch Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution, but perhaps more important to me, selfishly, is that she has a long past here at GMF. And I had the pleasure of having her as a colleague for her tenure here at GMF. She worked as an editor at Die Zeit before joining GMF, and in that role had the great privilege of working with Helmut Schmidt. As many of you will know, she is one of Germany's most prolific and thoughtful observers of foreign and security policy, and so grateful to have her perspective for this conversation as well. And now, the person who is going to bring this conversation together is our terrific moderator, David Ignatius. David, for all of us who are based here in Washington, is well known as a bi-weekly columnist for the Washington Post and an award-winning author of several best-selling novels. Now, for me, again, to put on my GMF hat, his most important role is that he is a trustee of GMF. And we know him as our best moderator. So I, with that, I'm going to turn it over to David. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, welcome, everyone. I thought I would begin this conversation about the life and legacy of Helmut Schmidt by quoting a passage from a book that I consult often, as do many of my colleagues who write about foreign affairs. And it just happens to have been written by the man sit sitting just to the right of me. It's the second volume of Henry Kissinger's memoirs. And I'm going to quote a passage that he wrote about Helmut Schmidt as a way of focusing all of us uh, on this man and who he was. Dr. Kissinger is writing about February 1974 and something that was called the Washington Energy Crisis. At that time, the, the Nixon administration was in a free fall. The, the Arab oil embargo had just happened. The world was very ragged. And Dr. Kissinger says that on February 10, he met with his old and cherished friend, Helmut Schmidt, then German finance minister. Schmidt and I had met 20 years earlier when on a visit of mine to the Federal Republic, he'd been introduced to me as a promising young man. He struck me then as brash, forceful, and intelligent. We stayed in touch over the years. Gradually, it dawned on me that the somewhat overbearing manner was the defense mechanism of a gentle, even sentimental man who had to stress his intellect and analytical power lest his emotions run away with him. Our friendship 
soon transcended the task that destiny imposed on us. We both knew that we served our countries not by imposing our views, but by seeking solutions both of us could believe in. That was published in 1982. I want to begin our conversation by asking doc Dr. Kissinger to just think aloud for us about Helmut Schmidt, who he was beyond that beautiful tribute, and what uh, we should think about his legacy for today in 2016. Well, for Helmut Schmidt and me to develop such a friendship, given our histories, was in itself a symbolic and event in a way for both of us. And he was a man, he was different from any other German leader that I met, or I would say most other leaders I met, in the sense that he did not appear as a German statesman. He appeared as a representative of principles. So he would take a problem and he would say, this is the essence of the problem. Then, of course, there would be a German side to that. But in principle, the basis of our friendship was that we both try to address the question, what ought one to do here? And what should be our purpose? And uh, then, of course, he might explain that there were special German problems, but the essence of the discussion was that he was talking in general principles. And in fact, on that occasion that we met, he uh, the problem was we were trying to establish an international energy agency by which countries could gauge their or pool their needs. And the issue in the conference was whether there should be a special European position or whether we should do it as a general idea. Some of the Europeans wanted a, a separate European institute, and Schmidt, by instinct, wanted the European solution, but he decided that the energy problem was not a problem for that could be dealt with on a national basis, and so he actually supported our position of making it an international a matter which was difficult for him in terms of its, uh, so the main thing to understand about Schmidt was, uh, as I pointed out in my eulogy of him, we knew each other for over 60 years, but he never uh, used the German colloquial do with me, <laughs> nor did he do it with Marion Dönhoff, who was his close associate at the uh, at the site and whom we both revered. Uh, it, this was, so it had this maybe interpreted as a lack of human relationship, but it really, in a way, was the opposite, that the human relationship was taken for granted. And you didn't have to give it any special significance by, uh, uh, and he was a man on whom one could absolutely count. Uh, he, Lee Kuan Yew, George Schultz, and I thought we had a special kind of friendship. And when the Tide interviewed him about it, he said, the essence of this friendship is that we know we will never, we will always say the exact truth to each other. And the, but you could, underneath all of this, you could count on the uh, human relationship. You could be sure that he had only one set of views. And uh, so, so the interest, I, I wrote 
an article at some point which I said history, which was wrong. Uh, I said history has not been kind to Helmut Schmidt because the, some other chancellors were given the opportunity to do historic events in German history. Brand and, uh, and Kohl with unification. And history had not given him this opportunity. But then, when you look at his life, he is the German chancellor who had the deepest respect decades for decades afterward. And his life's work is an achievement which may be greater than that of many of the great leaders associated with specific events. Uh, so if you approach the Helmut you had to have a problem. I mean, you had to discuss an issue with him. You could not discuss small talk. Small talk, <laughs> and he didn't want to hear about personality. <laughs> he wanted to know what is the problem. Then he would uh, discuss it. You could count on his defending what you read, what conclusion you read. Uh, you could be sure that if there was something wrong, in your argument, friendship would not interfere with his, <laughs> with his telling you. But therefore, for all of us who knew him for decades, he's a personality which we will never forget. And it, the fascinating thing is that the German people probably revere him now as the representative you know, as the chancellor who had the deepest, uh, uh, the deepest impact, and and also in the world, those of us who dealt with him uh, would uh, associate him with the big issues, and they went from nuclear armament to economic issues to Europe. Uh, and so one can always ask oneself the question, what would Schmidt have thought? And one would, have, one would feel what he would have thought would be relevant, and he would add intelligence, and he would add, he would add character. And I believe the two great qualities of a statesman have to be uh, 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 in, must include courage and vision. And he had both of these qualities uh, together with an enormous humanity. That's a, a, a beautiful evocation of him. Uh, let me turn to Constanza, who also had a personal relationship with Helmut Schmidt when you were a young journalist. Uh, you had the good fortune to be able to talk with him. I, I, I'm curious um, how you would describe the man and his legacy, but I'm also wondering what bits of advice he gave you uh, as a young person starting out your career that distilled uh, this life that uh, Dr. Kissinger described. Well, um, for one, uh, frankly, it's an honor to be sharing a podium with Henry Kissinger and Teo Sommer. I may say that. Um, and it was also an honor to sit uh, in the political section of Die Zeit's uh, bi-weekly uh, leader discussions uh, for 11 years with Helmut Schmidt. That in itself was an education. And since I, um, let me start another place. Um, I grew to be personally deeply fond of him. Um, it's not something that I would have expected. Um, for me, when I arrived there, he was a historical figure. Uh, you know, somebody who it was almost, you know, I was almost had to pinch myself that I actually was in the same room with this man. But he quickly became someone whom one engaged with in debate. And uh, I, as it happens, often violently disagreed with him on some of his policy positions. Um, and. I don't know, if, if for any of you who have ever been in an editorial meeting at Die Zeit, it was characterized by a legendary saying of Theo Sommers, 
uh, which was, why are you still talking when I interrupted you five minutes ago? <laughs> and <laughs> now, if you had Helmut Schmidt, Theo Sommer, Robert Leicht, Joe Joffe, Mike Naumann, and half a dozen other people, who, none of whom had weak opinions or a, a lack of self-confidence, if you were a younger female journalist who had possessed the audacity to, to, to decide to write about security policy, you were in a highly problematic position. <laughs> and uh, what I learned very quickly is that you really had to be able to fight if you were out there in this room so as to not be interrupted. And the, the thing that I then learned about Helmut Schmidt in an atmosphere where it took me a long time for people to take me seriously, if I may be so frank, is that if you got Helmut Schmidt's attention and his respect, basically that was when you won. And the moment when that came for me, I don't know whether you remember that, but there was one moment uh, where Helmut Schmidt said to Joe Joffe, shut up, Joe, I want to hear what Frau Stelzenmüller has to say about this. <laughs> and as far as I was concerned, this was my Ritterschlag. When I was knighted, I was officially and formally knighted and uh, you know, considered as a serious person. Um, and after that, I would ha yeah, I took on some courage from this moment. And when I, if I wrote anything that hadn't appeared to decide, I would always pass him a copy. And uh, three or four weeks later, his secretaries would call up Frau Kruger-Pensky or Frau Niemeyer and say, the chancellor wishes to discuss your piece with you. Um, and I would come in, and he would have edited it in green felt tip. You know, this is the, 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 the color the chancellor uses. And he would go through it with me, paragraph by paragraph, despite the fact that it had already appeared somewhere. <laughs> and there were only two comments on the, on the margins. Uh, one, one was, uh, this is completely wrong, or unfortunately correct. <laughs> and, <laughs> I would, <laughs> and I would grab this after, I would grab this precious you know, stack of paper and take it away from him, and then photocopy it and send a copy to my dad. <laughs> um, so, so yes, I was deeply saddened uh, when he died. Um, and I, um, I, I think I owe him a great deal of my education. And I owe him, um, I, owe him I think, also the, the fact that he was perhaps not a mentor, but he was a forebird. He was a, an example to emulate in his fierce work ethos and his equally fierce dedication to a larger cause. Um, and that to me was monumental. In, in that sense, he really, in, in despite all the many policy disagreements that I had with him, uh, in that, you know, he really was and remains a hero. Theo Summer, in the years after Helmut Schmidt left as chancellor uh, in 1982, you were his uh, colleague uh, at Desite as uh, the I was the editor publisher in chief who groomed him in. Well, you so you uh, <laughs> that must have been quite a quite a job. You had help from from a, a young uh, reporter, Constanza. I'd love to hear your sense of him and how he evolved over those years. And uh, in particular, I'm just curious if uh, there were worries that he had about the course of that Germany had taken with all of its growth and dynamism that you heard him express? Well, let me say, first of all, uh, I'm very honored to be here, too. Uh, he was a friend for more than 60 years. I first met him in a sleeper compartment on a train from Geneva to Hamburg uh, after an ISS conference uh, in Geneva. Uh, he was writing his first book about defense or retaliation, 61, that appeared. Uh, and uh, over some beers, we talked about nuclear strategy till 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, that, that was uh, the beginning of our connection. When he became Minister of Defense, he appointed me uh, uh, planning chief in the Ministry of Defense. I organized a huge inventory of the German armed forces uh, and wrote the first defense white book. Um, so that, that was my approach to him. And, and one thing I remember, uh, when he took office as Minister of Defense, uh, he discovered that about 200 holes had been drilled along the intra-German border, border between the, German, uh, uh, the, the Federal Republic and the GDR. And 
nuclear mines were to be planted, installed in these holes or near these holes, uh, and they would have to, uh, they would explode automatically if any Soviet tank or infantry battalion came anywhere close. And he was aghast, so were we all, uh, because that nothing, not much of Germany would have been left. And then w uh, with uh, the uh, Secretary of Defense at the time, Melvin Laird, they agreed to kill that project. Uh, so that, that was uh, my beginning. And then our path crossed again when uh, the founder and owner of Die, uh, Die Zeit uh, made him publisher. Uh, now, uh, he, he was the second German politician who became a journalist or a writer <laughs> after leaving office. The first one was Bismarck. <laughs> but he, he only wrote mischievous uh, uh, editorials about his successors, whereas Schmidt really remained objective. He always analyzed problems. Uh, he, uh, he tried, as he said, to give orientation. Uh, he, his secretary would never have said, the chancellor wants to see your, uh, if, no, the chef. It was the chef. <laughs> uh, he was not the chancellor, but he became very quickly a colleague whom you could interrupt as well. Uh, and anyway, interruption is a sign of quick mental association. <laughs> uh, now, defense strategy remained one of the topics of his life. Second life was, a uh, second topic was Europe. Uh, and he realized that Europe would not make any headway without a close cooperation between Paris and what, what was then Bonn. Uh, but in his later years, he said, uh, German-French relations worked only th three times between Adenauer and de Gaulle, between Schmidt and Giscard. Together, they started the EQ, the precursor of the Euro, and between Kohl and Mitterrand. I think he would be very saddened by the present state of German, Franco-German affairs. Uh, he, today, uh, would say, we expanded the European Union to eastward too early. It would have been enough uh, to let these countries join NATO. You said so. This is where we disagreed. Uh, <laughs> he today would say no German hubris. Uh, don't think we have tell, to tell all the world what to do especially with regard to Russia and China, he always said uh, these are age-old civilizations. Uh, they have their own traditions. Uh, they need time to evolve. Uh, don't always point your fingers at them, at, uh, finger at them. Uh, and he would uh, vehemently disagree with any kind of military intervention. He would be against Syria. Uh, you would par probably quarrel with him about that. Even Bosnia, he thought, uh, shouldn't have been, yeah. we shouldn't have intervened. So, uh, but he's, he, he became more pessimistic about the course of the world uh, as he grew older. Uh, but his, his main message was, uh, don't you ever try to lord it over the Europeans. So we're going to uh, turn to the audience in a moment uh, uh, for your questions, but I'd like to ask one more round uh, of, our, of our panelists uh, from on stage. And I'd like to focus first, Dr. Kissinger, on the question of uh, Schmidt's view of Russia. 
he's famous uh, in part for his decision, very courageous political decision, to support the installation of U.S. Pershing missiles in Germany to count, counter the Soviet SS-20s. He made that decision in 1979. It was immensely controversial, but it was, I think many people would say, one of the turning points in the, in the story of the, of the Cold War. I'd like to ask you, um, in light of that toughness, what Schmidt would make of the seeming return of a Cold War mentality between Russia and the United States that we have been watching these last several years? What, what would he say about that? Uh, he would be, and he was, very unhappy uh, with the Cold War mentality, with uh, the evolution of Cold War mentality. Uh, when he started his career, uh, Germany was just beginning to become an independent nation. And the concept was that there was, the dividing line was along the Elbe, and there was a possible threat of a Soviet invasion. And he was passionately convinced of the importance of linking America and Germany in a, a common enterprise. And the deployment of the Pershing missiles was partly due to his conviction that one should not leave, that the decision on nuclear matters should not be left entirely on one side of the Atlantic and that there should be some organic link between Europe and the United States so that if the Soviets attacked in Europe, uh, they would confront a nuclear threat and therefore would be deterred from something that had been organically built into, uh, uh, into the system. Uh, and of course, I, I agreed with, with his view. But he never thought that the strategic outcome or the strategic discussions could be the end of the relationship. And he saw even that decision as a step towards building in time a larger relationship with Eastern Europe. He supported Brunt's uh, 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 politic and spoke to me uh, frequently about that at a time when the Nixon administration initially uh, was uh, doubtful about it. As time evolved, uh, he developed the view that Russia has to be an organic part of an international system. And that, to, to, that one could not exclude Russia from the international system and one could not deal with it in an inherently confrontational manner, and that at least one owed it to the future to have a dialogue with Putin, even under these less promising conditions. Uh, I must say, I agree with him on, on, that, on that issue. And so he would feel that Ukraine is not an issue that can be built into an alliance relationship. That Ukraine should be, con should be treated as a part of a relationship between Europe, America, and Russia, and that one should therefore at least owe it to ourselves to have a dialogue on that issue rather than to see whether we can confront Russia and make it uh, back down, whether one should rather find a concept that would uh, 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 you, you know, unite these. And he uh, encouraged uh, a dialogue with Russia and with perhaps within, uh, he was leaning more towards a dialogue with Russia towards the end of his life than towards a dialogue with America because he thought that that was uh, the, uh, uh, that, that it had been neglected. 
and I did not agree with him on his attitude towards the United States in the last years of his life, but I have no doubt that if a dialogue had been started, uh, he would have taken his usual position, which was this had to be dealt with as a, a problem for, uh, for the future of Europe and the future of America uh, together. Constanza, I'd be interested in, in your thoughts about what Helmut Schmidt uh, would say about this uh, return of the Cold War, what, what um, his own experience uh, through all, the whole of his career uh, would tell him and, and would tell us. And I'm also curious what you think he would feel about Germany's emergence, re-emergence, as the overwhelming and dominant power in <coughs> Europe, um, which is so visible with Chancellor Merkel, uh, would, would that have made him uncomfortable, or would it have struck him as uh, just an inevitable fact of, of current life? All right, th those are two really complicated questions. I'll, I'll try and give a succinct answer to both. Um, on Russia, uh, we knew what he thought, um, and it's what Henry Kissinger has just described. And I, I think I, uh, I mean, would have disagreed with him on key elements of the analysis. Um, for one, because I think we have in Putin someone who doesn't share the memories of World War II, which were the, the, the strongest emotional and experiential bond between Western state, statesmen and Eastern statesmen, and, and including Russian statesmen, for a generation. I mean, even the Brezhnevs and Dropovs and Chernyankos knew that they did not want one thing, and it was a renewal of war. You know? And they believed in a balance of power, and they believed in a balance um, of, of respect, I think. We are now dealing with a Russian leader uh, who does not believe in balance, uh, who in fact uh, uses and it creates and exploits imbalance to keep the West um, in, a status, status, uh, in, a, in, a stat, uh, in a situation of unease and uncertainty with regard to his intentions. And I would, if I were arguing this out with Helmut Schmidt, I would say, and you're the one who invested in the Pershings, and I supported you on that. Um, in fact, I was going to law school in Bonn in the, in the first half of the 80s. I'm sure I'm on a lot of photographs of, that the Secret Service has made, including the CIA, because if, if you went to a lecture in the morning in Bonn, you were going to go through a per, an anti-Pershing demonstration. I was actually for the damn Pershings, and, um, which was not an easy position to take, uh, except actually at Bonn Law School, where everybody was you know, pretty much to the right of Attila the Hunt, uh, which I wasn't. Um, but um, the... I, I would say that I, uh, I would say to Helmut Schmidt, you know what? This is a time to reinvest in deterrence, and you're you're the model for that, yeah, and this is what we have to do. And then we can talk to Mr. Putin, who is not a statesman but a gambler, yeah, from a position of conviction and strength. The other thing that I think that Helmut Schmidt, um, you know, R.I.P. and bless his memory, didn't really I think factor into his considerations was the agency of civil societies. I think that was something that to him was essentially alien. Yeah. And to me, the agency of civil societies in Eastern Europe, and particularly in Ukraine, is something that we must not discount, have to respect, and have to you know, give a preeminent place in our considerations of what is acceptable and what isn't, and what is in line with our values. Um, again, I would have been had fun to have had this debate with him. Now, on, on the Germany question, uh, again, that's something we knew, because Helmut Schmidt was warning us all the time about German hubris. I don't think uh, that what Germany has done in the last two years, ever since the famous three speeches in Munich, has been a display of hubris. In, I, I'm kind of proud of the fact that I think a generation of German policymakers said, you know, frankly, what we're doing isn't good enough, and uh, we need to do more. We need to take on more responsibility. Um, and what I regret, though, is, is two things. One, that this is you know, we're exercising leadership um, by default because other nations, particularly Great Britain and France, are sort of going through inward-looking moments. 
And I, I often think that you know, even if we're trying to get the principle right, we do, you know, we, we have flawed delivery, to put it mildly. Yeah. Um, very often, something that is extremely well-intentioned and thought out comes across as unilateral um, and, and not thought out, thought out with regards to the consequences uh, for the neighbors. The Energiewende is a case in point. Um, the, uh, the opening the borders to refugees, which I think was a magnificent gesture, um, also had massive negative knock-on effects for the neighbors, which I think we failed to take into account. So I think, you know, and that is something he would have justly warned us about and been very upset by. Theo Zumber, before we uh, turn to the audience, I would like to just uh, ask you to reflect a little bit more about Helmut Schmidt and the European project. He really was one of the foundation stones, especially, as you said, in his uh, relationship with Giscard. We're looking at a Europe that is struggling uh, with such difficulty in making that vision of an ever wider, ever deeper union work. Uh, and I wonder uh, what your reflections are on that, whether you ever heard um, Schmidt express concern about uh, decisions that he'd made in that process of, of building the, the Europe we have today, and what he'd say about finding a way, a path back <laughs> to a more stable Europe. Well, I guess, uh, it's just uh, a guesstimate. Uh, he would say we finally have to enact those things which we did not enact when we introduced the Euro. So go back to that uh, and, and uh, build the political foundations for this financial superstructure. Uh, I guess I've heard, I, I seem to remember I've heard him say maybe we have to go for not only for a two-speed Europe, but maybe for a four-speed Europe. And there should be a core Europe based on the Euro zone, which still pursues that goal of the ever closer union of peoples, and then let the others on, uh, on the periphery uh, do whatever they feel they can do or want to do. Uh, but don't keep stuffing euros down their throats any longer. Uh, I, I would like to say just one word about his uh, criticism of America. And uh, you, one heard a lot of that uh, during his time. He didn't like, uh, well, it, during the Nixon administration, uh, when you, as you said, Henry, you were doubtful about Ostpolitik. Uh, I think he convinced you that this Germany was not on the way out to ra towards another Rapallo. Uh, he did have his uh, problems with the uh, uh, Carter administration over the SS-20s. Uh, he had uh, severe criticism of uh, George W. Bush's uh, positions. But basically, he always said, I believe in the resilience of the American people. They have the capacity to correct themselves, correct their mistakes, and, <clears throat> and return in, their, in the reality of their politics uh, to the ideological foundations of their politics. So uh, he, was, he was not anti-American. He was a disappointed friend of America. And I think, please. Uh, one of the things that got him critical of the Carter administration was he had enormous respect for, for Ford as a president. And he, in principle anyway, thought that the relations between countries should depend on underlying principles. So, and uh, the Carter administration sent Vice President Mondale to Germany very early. And uh, Mondale said to him, uh, we, we are going to eradicate many of the elements. Uh, and he considered that an outrage. Uh, Mundell was a good man and 
and it was it, not really very partisan, but uh, he was using some campaign rhetoric as the expression of foreign policy, and that offended Schmidt. Uh, as a matter of principle, and uh, but then later on, his criticism of America was that of a of an uncle to a favorite nephew who had disappointed him and had not lived up to the expectations. Uh, so there was never a question of America as such. And I think even in the current crisis, even though uh, he, um, how to deal with Putin, uh, he would have disagreed with you, as I do. Uh, he would have, uh, if it had come to a real, to a real showdown, there's no question where he would have been, and with what, and, and with, uh, with strong conviction. So let me now turn to the audience. If you could uh, raise your hands, keep your questions short, identify yourselves, uh, and direct them to a particular panelist, uh, if that's possible. And yes, sir. Yeah, I'm Norman Birnbaum from Georgetown University and the weekly The Nation. Uh, my, my question is for Theo. Um, uh, who knew Schmidt? Uh, uh, best. Uh, it's possible to divide the post-war history of uh, the Federal Republic into two currents, Rhenish, Catholic, Western, Prussian, Protestant, Eastern. Uh, at any rate, uh, Helmut Schmidt uh, was a Protestant, uh, had interesting conversations with uh, many theologians, although he was well able to uh, restrain his theological enthusiasm for contemporaries like Epler, who were also Protestant. But what about Schmidt's Protestantism? What role did that play in his life? Well, to be frank, uh, the longer he lived, the, nor, the more he became an atheist. Uh, he didn't believe in a God that admitted Auschwitz. He didn't believe uh, in the bib biblical uh, recipe, when the other cheek. Um, uh, turn, turn the other cheek, thank turn you. Turn the other cheek, he said, uh, a statesman cannot simply turn the other cheek if that risks the existence of his nation. So there were many things uh, he, he pondered about. Uh, actually, you know, he, he, he had a very philosophical mind. He had what he called uh, his three home pharmacists. One was Mark Aurelius, uh, whose uh, basic work he had in his backpack during uh, half a year. Uh, in, in, in the Russian campaign. Uh, the other one was uh, Max Weber, who said no emotion, uh, only rationality in politics. Uh, and the third one was uh, Karl Popper. Uh, what was this? Uh, piece, piecemeal engineering. Don't try big jumps. They always fail. And then, of course, Kant and Reinhold Niebuhr, uh, the serenity prayer. Uh, God, give me, what is it? The strength to change what I can. No, the God, give me the serenity, accept the, uh, the thing I cannot change. The courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Uh, he, he very often talked about philosophy, and he, he read a lot about it. He also, I, I noted that reading about him, was a concert-quality pianist who recorded Bach and Mozart, uh, Man for All Seasons. Margaret? Your Secretary of State, Helmut Schmidt, is Chancellor of Germany. Uh, 
how would you deal with Vladimir Putin? Well, I, I, have, I have argued that the Ukraine crisis started through inadvertence of the European policymakers. Right. That they did not understand the symbolic implications of Ukraine. Henry, Brussels politic, uh, policy makers. Partly Brussels policy makers. And uh, I have argued that we should come up with a concept of the Ukraine within its present borders uh, and perhaps treat Crimea like East Germany was treated during the uh, before before unification, and to at least attempt a dialogue not on the me on the mechanisms of maintaining a ceasefire, but on the evolution of Eurasia and maybe of the world, because Russia has played an integral historic role in this. Its magnitude makes it an essential part of a European system, but its internal problems make it impossible to play the dominant role that it has, some of its writers have visualized for itself. Now, I don't know where this would lead, but I agree with Schmidt's view that we owe it to ourselves before we slide ourselves into a series of confrontations on tactical issues. Uh, and I think in any event, some Russian leader will have to address this question. And so, so I would try to get away from the tactical issues that now, and domestic policy issues that now affect so many countries. Uh, I would like to see an independent Ukraine, but not as part of a military system uh, of the West. Uh, yes, question in the second row. Jeff James from the ICGS. Ted, I think this is probably more for you. Of the three chancellors that followed Schmidt, which one did he have a good relationship with, a bad relationship with? How did he relate to his three predecessors, his, to his three successors? And which one did he like the best? <laughs> well, I, I would say his relationship with Helmut Kohl was uh, awkward, <laughs> let's put it that way. <laughs> Uh, but uh, several years ago, Kohl visited him in the presser house in Hamburg. They sat together for two hours, and uh, I don't know whether they made up, but at least I think they recognized each other's historical role. I guess Schmidt uh, regretted the fact that he didn't have the chance to harvest the fruits of Ostpolitik. <laughs> but that's natural. Uh, Schroeder uh, came to see him uh, rather frequently. <coughs> I don't have the impression he listened to him very much. <laughs> 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 but they talked. Uh, and I don't know about his relationship with Merkel. I, I think they, they were so different. Uh, and, and, and I, she is not a person. You know, normally when you talk to Schmidt or when he talks to people, there's a German uh, phrase, uh, he, ask, he asks holes into you by questioning you. Uh, and he couldn't do that with Merkel. <laughs> so, and, and, and also when you ask him about today's headlines or yesterday's headlines, he usually said, ich mische mich nicht in die Tagespolitik ein. I don't want to get involved into, uh, politics. Uh, into daily, politics. daily politics, yes. Um, 
I see a hand in the back. Yes, please. Hi, Stefan Grober with Euronews. Um, Dr. Kissinger, t tonight is uh, President Obama's last State of the Union address. I wonder whether you could assess today's German-American relations um, and how they um, evolved over the last seven years compared to the time when you were in office. Thank you. When, when, when I was in office, it was 40 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> some, some evolution <laughs> was inevitable. <laughs> I think today German-American relations are, are close on a day-to-day -day basis. I do not think that German-American relations are based on a view of, a common view of a likely historic evolution, but they're very practical. They deal effectively uh, with existing problems, and they are, uh, uh, they are closed. Uh, I, I think the West, the West, or the world really, has to address the issue of where we are going in a world in which there are revolutions taking place in every continent on the basis of principles that are not uniform uh, by societies who don't share their history, and where technology is developing at a rate uh, that makes a conflict between major countries almost automatically a World War I type of experience. Uh, I don't think that issue is being systematically addressed within governments and between governments. And on that level, they are not as ideal as one, as I would wish from that point of view, but not because of any failure of its, its I think that there are probably two reasons that the events themselves are so complicated that simply to navigate them requires a tremendous effort. And also that the type of leaders that emerge in societies that are more and more computerized are more focused on the day-to-day -day events and the day-to-day -day perceptions than on the sort of philosophical attitudes that the leaders of the 50s and 60s and 70s uh, had, and that that gives an urgency uh, to day-to-day -day decisions that, in, that previously we were one attempted to absorb in a bigger concept. But I don't blame it on policy making. I bl blame it on the conception of history and of uh, and of a lack of understanding of the inherent risk of having a world system based in, on such precarious foundation. I could ask uh, Constanza just briefly to reflect on this question of German-American relations. Uh, it is uh, worrying for us in America when <coughs> someone who knows us as well as Helmut Schmidt is expressing deep misgivings. Uh, it worries us when we see the reaction of young Germans to the Snowden revelations, when we feel that there is just a widening gap uh, culturally, perhaps politically, between these uh, societies. Um, what thoughts do you have about the extent to which there's a real deep split and what to do about it? Okay, um, thank you. That's actually a question that um, I, I do have some some thoughts about, um, maybe because I'm in a specific generational situation to have seen both ends of this. Um, the <clears throat> I remember as a child 
Um, I'm a foreign service brat, so I actually spent most of my childhood outside of Germany. But the, the times in, and I, in fact, part of it was spent here in Washington in the 70s. I went to the German school here. But in Germany, I have vivid childhood memories of the importance of American clubs. In particular, the American club in Plettersdorf in Bonn, where not only was there an extremely large swimming pool, but there were burgers and sundaes to be had. Also, there was an American movie theater. And my mother had an American friend who was married to a German civil servant whose firm conviction was that a woman was entitled to two things, a large enough kitchen, or larger than, than you had to have to swing a cat in, and the second was to have Saturday, night, Saturday afternoon off from your children by sending them to the movies. My mother felt that this might corrupt us culturally, but the notion of the Saturday afternoon off won her over, and the result of this was that I spent every Saturday afternoon for four years in the American movie theater in Plittersdorf, thus you know, corrupting me thoroughly at an extremely early age. <laughs> and I cannot overstate, seriously, I'm being slightly jokey about this, but I cannot overstate the importance that these cultural connections had for my generation of Germans. And conversely, I believe, for many, many Americans who, for, for one reason or another, um, spent part of their childhood in Germany because their father very often was engaged in the military or US diplomacy or one of the America houses. This, this created a tissue of societal relationships you know, that is sadly now becoming thinner and thinner with the closure of American bases, the disappearance of the America Häuser, and the disappearance of, of, these, um, of these relations. Now, the, on the official level, and I'm sure Ambassador Wittig can, can corroborate that, I don't think relations on the official level have been this good in decades. People work together very closely from what I can see in the, the White House and the Chancery, DOD, state. I mean, they're, these, these are friendly, they're, they're uh, collaborative, and yes, we had uh, some misunderstandings about the NSA, but I would say that that was an exception. Um, and that in general, this is, this is the collaboration in the Obama years has been very, very close. But I think we ought to be deeply worried about the disappearance of these societal networks. And this is something I would like us to see, do something about. Um, th that's something that really is close to my heart. Um, the other thing that I'd like to mention is that, um, or to come, come back to briefly, is this, this point of the war experience. Um, and it's something that Schmidt talked to us a, a lot about. And his, his most famous expression that we as editors were particularly fond of is that Helmut Schmidt would say, die Scheiße des Krieges, which I'm not going to translate for you, but you can guess what it means. <laughs> um, and it was deeply felt. He had had a horrific time as a, as a young officer. Um, and for those of us as reporters who had actually gone to war, zone in this war zones and, and reported from there, which includes me, or in my case, post-war zones, which frankly is bad enough, we, we understood viscerally, deeply, what he meant. And I think it is why people like me and others that I know at Zeit and elsewhere share this profound emotion about not wanting to see war ever again in Europe, or for that matter, in its periphery, and wanting, wanting to have leaders, treaties, relations, diplomatic networks, economic networks that prevent that kind of thing. That, that I think, is if, if there is any legacy that this generation had to pass on, it's this. Hey, oh, Just uh, a note on the first part of your answer. Uh, I think uh, it would be fair to say that the Plittersdorf community was rather limited. Uh, yeah, there were many Plittersdorfs all over Germany. Uh, Don't forget that. Listen. K-Town, Yes, but there, there the are, there, there are compensatory uh, uh, developments. At the time, there were, were a few hundred German exchange students in the uh, now we have thousands. We have thousands of German business people. We have thousands of tourists. I, I think it's not at all on that level. The real level why Germans uh, don't feel, let's say, enthusiastic about the United <coughs> States at the moment is that your political system uh, has degenerated to the point of uh, polarized, uh, to, to the point of dysfunctionality. And, we don't and as soon, <laughs> diff, uh, ours works pretty right, we pretty well. But let's <laughs> let's wait the, for the next nine months. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, I I think as soon as we see that it works again here, 
all the, the distrust will vanish in a moment. But if there is going to be a, a President Donald Trump uh, next year, things will get worse. We, uh, on verra, as the, yeah. as the French say. <laughs> um, I, uh, I want to turn to Rick Burt for a last question. And I just would note that in uh, making real the political decision that Helmut Schmidt made courageously to install the Pershing missiles, Rick Burt was one of the Americans who made sure that relationship was strong enough to sustain it. Um, Could I make a brief comment? Please. On, and then on uh, uh, I think uh, the probably German-American problem on the German side is in part that of the European nations, Germany really has the least experience in multilateral diplomacy. That for the, it was the last country to be unified. Uh, it was then, it lived with the perception of being surrounded by hostile nations in every incarnation so that it really didn't have to conduct a global thinking uh, and uh, approach so that, the, that there is no generation of Germans that has a real experience of dealing on a, except the current generation. And in my view, uh, they that some of the Germans below 50 who uh, did not experience the war are now mo moving from a period in which Germany thought it was the most powerful country that could prevail by its power into be perhaps thinking it is a super moral country that can judge the world by, uh, by absolute uh, uh, principles. And I think the reaction to the NSA thing, which was certainly painful and unfortunate, there were reasons how these things happened. Uh, have, in my view, been based on an excessive uh, claim to moral superiority on issues for which one can at least understand the uh, the uh, uh, the evolution, but uh, this is my impression. Just one sentence. I, I think that uh, the NSA issue has been pushed to the back burner by the terrorists. Well, also by the realization that the BND did some fairly comprehensive <laughs> spying of its own, um, which I think made us lose our moral virginity on this one fairly comprehensively. <laughs> so, uh, last question from uh, from Rick. Thank you, David. I, uh, I think I will, I was going to uh, ask a question actually about the NSA thing, and I think I will anyway, even though <laughs> sort of beat that horse to death. Uh, and I'm going to, I guess, I, since I live in Washington, I've tried to master the art of making a comment in terms of a question. <laughs> but you, you actually, David, referred to that period and, uh, earlier where we had the debate in with the United States and Germany over the deployment, the double track decision, deployment of Pershings. And I honestly believe that the reason we were finally successful there, not just in deploying, but then getting an agreement that eliminated this whole category of weapons later in the 1980s, was because of remarkable work done conceptually, but equally important diplomatically in consultation, not only between Germany and the United States, between the United States and its allies. It was really a remarkable period where the Europeans themselves were able, in a sense, to take ownership, both of the defense decision, but also the diplomacy that was involved. Where I think, and I would get, I would, I guess I'd like to ask the panel, in a sense, could, couldn't we do the same when it comes to intelligence collection. W nuclear policy began as a kind of American unilateral business in the 50s and 60s. 
And it wasn't until Europeans understood the stakes, like Helmut Schmidt and others, that they demanded a voice in that process. And guess what? Beginning with the, the Nixon-Kissinger era through the Reagan administration, they had that voice. Unless you're a member of the so-called Five Eyes, you don't have that voice. You're not part of the club. You're not, you're not consulted. You don't have a, 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 a voice in shaping the policy process. Couldn't couldn't the uh, German government and the U.S. government be much more creative in coming to grips with this, with this issue, which in its essence, as you know, is, very, is closely related to the whole issue of terrorism, because that's what the NSA issue is really focused on right now. So let me uh, take that uh, broad uh, question as a uh, vehicle for asking our panelists to make uh, final comments. Rick has raised a uh, fundamental question uh, for all of us as we think about the legacy of Helmut Schmidt, and that is how do we get a broad basis for transatlantic cooperation, uh, for dealing with east-west problems, a uh, whole range of things. Intelligence cooperation is one we particularly think about now thinking about, about terrorism. But Perhaps uh, each of you could take uh, a minute or two to make some concluding uh, remarks uh, on Rick's question and the general uh, topic we've been discussing, st starting with you, if you would, uh, Theo. Well, actually, I agree with your question. I don't have the answer. I think our p politicians are simply overwhelmed by too many crises at the same time. They don't really have the time to give any deeper thought uh, to a larger concept. Uh, and I don't know whether that will change. Uh, we are all focusing on our uh, domestic policies, and that will be more so this year and next year than before even. So I guess we'll simply have to, to wait till things, till the dust settles a bit, um, which is not. Uh, a very convincing answer. Uh, I, I would like to, to, to say two things. I've uh, been a personal friend of Helmut Schmidt for 61 years, and we also, we never uh, used the thou. It was the Hamburg do, Z and first names. And that was, uh, that was it. Uh, I've, I think I've, been friends with you, or at least we have known each other, a, a year longer than I knew Helmut. <laughs> uh, the first article I ever wrote in Die Zeit was a review of Henry's great book, Nuclear Weapons and Foreign Policy. Half a page. Uh, <laughs> that. And uh, then he came to Hamburg. Uh, to, to lecture about nuclear weapons and foreign policy. And then uh, they said, well, of course, Dr. Kissinger, you're going to speak German. He said, for God's sake, I thought about this in English. I wrote it in English. I don't have the slightest idea what second strike capability might be in German. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, well, Dr. Kissinger, if it's all right with you, and if you speak in short paragraphs, I'll do the translation for you. And he agreed, and then he started in German. <laughs> <laughs> and what he said was, mit meinem Deutsch ist es wie mit meinem Gepäck. Es kommt erst morgen. <laughs> my German is like my luggage. It will come only tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, but, but from these two people, I've learned one thing. I think that has enriched my life, that you can be friends and remain friends with people with whom you vehemently disagree on some issues. And that was a great privilege uh, to profit from that in my relationship with Helmut and in the relationship with Henry. Thank you. Constanza. Well, uh, I can't claim for, uh, a friendship with Helmut Schmidt. Um, I remember vividly that he took an extremely dim view of the abilities of the German Federal Intelligence Service. 
Uh, he was scathing about it uh, whenever he spoke about it, but that was sort of par for the course. He was scathing, scathing about the abilities of, of a lot of institutions and people, uh, for that matter. But um, I think that uh, Rick Bird is right, that uh, understanding our strategic, the strategic landscape around us is, the, I think, the most important thing um, Western democracies have to be able to do. Um, and I think the sooner we get a grip on this, the better. I'm, I'm very hard-nosed about this. I, I think we shouldn't be, you know, again, uh, trying to recover our virginity about these things. I think we should admit we need intelligence services, make them work together, end of next, next topic. Um, I do have a, you did ask me, um, David, about uh, whether Helmut Schmidt gave me any advice. And I've just remembered that he did at one point. He, on one of these conversations about, you know, pieces that I'd, I'd forwarded the, to him, he put aside the stack of paper, looked at me severely, and said, I have something else that I need to discuss with you. And I, I, I can't tell you, I mean, with this, this look that he could have, uh, my heart sank, and I briefly reviewed all the articles I'd just written and whether there could have been anything in there to offend him. And he looked at me and said, I think it's time for you to write a book. And I was thunderstruck. And I said, why are you saying this? And he said, I've been watching you. I think you know your stuff now, and I think it's time you wrote a book. And then he, he put on this inimitable smile that he had, the famous, you know, Zähneblecken, the toothy smile that was caricatured so wonderfully by Lorio, and said, I did that too when I was your age, and as you can see, pause, it hasn't done me any damage. <laughs> <laughs> My, my <laughs> editor, Ben Bradley's only real advice to me was to make sure to read the sports page. So, um, well, Dr. Kissinger, last, last thought. What the important experience of, the Schmidt, of Schmidt and of, I would say, of the generation that they which is each other at the time, was that at least some of the leaders shared a sense of a common experience and that they did not treat foreign policy entirely as a series of technical problems and as a series of programs uh, that, that have to be fulfilled. And therefore, many of them have re remained friends long after they left office while in the contemporary world, all the pressures are to deal with the immediate issues and then to go on to something else. Uh, and Schmidt, you knew he cared. And you knew he was seized by the problems that you dealt with him officially for the rest, uh, for the rest of his life. So he acted as a kind of a conscience for all of us and the issue of nationality really uh, uh, did not arise. And really, what I think one ought to take from, from his life is to see whether one can imagine dialogues and visions that are based on some perception of where one Im wants the world to be and not just as an abstract schoolboy vision, but it's something to which you then dedicate yourself uh, in your work and in your studies. Uh, and that's uh, uh, when Schmidt had a problem, he didn't come to you and say, look, we Germans are very bothered by this. He would say, this is a problem, and here is its essence. And when I thought of an issue, I would go to Schmidt, not to find out what the Germans were thinking, but to find out what the right answer might be. And if one could elevate policy to a level like this, then one would have confidence that we are heading in a uh, uh, positive uh, direction. And that's what I take from uh, my friendship with Schmidt, and not what I take 
but what Schmidt gave to the world and why he will be remembered uh, for dedicating himself to our future. I uh, sometimes think of diplomacy and statecraft uh, with that phrase that medi medievalists use, the great chain of being that's handed from uh, person to person, from country to country. And I have to be honest, I've rarely felt that uh, as vividly as during today's discussion, which was so personal and intimate from three people who knew Helmut Schmidt um, so well. Yeah, it's a, a rare chance to listen to the three of you. Thank you so much on behalf of all of us.